It's great to be back, and it's an honor to be invited to be a part of your schedule for these three days, and uh, I promise you uh, I will do everything in my power to keep it from being boring. Having sat through a lot of boring chapels in my life, I know the misery of that kind of thing. <laughs> Every one of my three talks will start with a statement. It will then be followed by a story or an illustration that I hope drives that statement home. Then we'll take a glance at the scriptures and see something in there that might tie in with the opening statement and the illustration, and then we'll close with another story. That's my plan. And so as we are together, you can hold me to it. I'll be through by 11.15, so you can put your watch away. I'll watch it closely. Let me start with a statement that has uh, come to my attention through the writings of Malcolm Muggeridge. Any happening, great or small, is a parable whereby God speaks to us. And the art of life is to get the message. Once again, any happening, great or small, is a parable whereby God speaks to us. And the art of life is to get the message. You sit where other students have sat over the years in the long history of Wheaton College. You've been told that before. You'll remember that when you're gone. There will be songs that will be linked to your memory for the rest of your life that you sang here and some you learned here. But these memories will stay with you. However, there will always be a few who come and then go having never gotten it. Muggeridge is right. The art of life is to get the message. I don't know of a better context in which to get the message, whatever the message is, one thing to one person and something altogether different to someone else. There's no better context in which to do that than these years in your college days and months as they pass by. But if you're not careful, I say again, you'll miss the message. Now the story. Speaking of context and the importance of it, the question was asked by the Washington Post newspaper in a banal setting and at an inconvenient time, would people pause to observe transcendent beauty. This question was asked by the paper, and then to answer it, they asked Joshua Bell, one of the foremost violin players of our generation, to play in a Washington subway during the morning rush hour dressed in a nondescript manner, jeans and t-shirt and a baseball cap, Joshua Bell opened up his violin case, took out his violin. It was called the Gibson X Huberman, handcrafted 1713 by Antonio Stradivari, and began to play magnificent music. He started with Chacon, from Bach's Partita No. 2 in D minor. Some have called it the greatest piece of music ever written. Others consider it one of the greatest achievements of any man in history, certainly the history of music. For 45 minutes, one of the greatest musicians alive, playing one of the greatest instruments ever made, played some of the greatest music ever written. Did anyone stop to listen in the Washington subway? It was all videotaped on camera. 1,100 people walked by during those 45 minutes. Seven stopped to listen. 27 tossed money into the open case. It totaled 
$32 at the end of the 45 minutes. What is interesting is the night before, Joshua Bell had sold out the Boston Symphony Hall where the cheapest seats go for $100. He regularly earns $1,000 a minute <laughs> for concerts. Some people never get it. Context matters. You have the context whether you get it or not during these three, four years, or however long you spend at this school, all depends on you. And your cooperation with the work of the Holy Spirit, especially in the realm of spiritual disciplines, none of which can be learned from a textbook but all of which can go with you for the rest of your life and make the difference. It's on that subject I want to speak. I've been haunted by half a verse for about 45, 46 years of ministry. The half verse appears in Paul's words to Timothy, chapter 4, the end of verse 7 where we read these words. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Isn't it interesting that uh, this is not something that was to be done for Timothy. It was a command given by the apostle to his younger colleague in ministry. You, Timothy, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Interesting half verse begins with a command and ends with an objective. The command is the term discipline. There's sweat in the word. The term originally, the one Paul used, is the word from which we get our term gymnasium. Gunazo. Gymnasium yourself, obviously, meaning there's a process that goes on, Timothy, in your life. It will require effort, time, consistency, focus, determination commitment. We've just come through the Olympics and we've watched the result of those who for at least four years, many of them more than eight years of their lives, have trimmed themselves down and committed themselves with focused attention to the discipline of their particular realm of athletics. And we've all applauded even those who didn't win a gold or silver or even bronze medal, we've applauded their effort. Why? Because we admire those who discipline themselves. But that's for a wreath that will perish, a medal that will tarnish. This objective is a goal called godliness. Discipline yourself students at Wheaton for the purpose of godliness. Godliness. What is that? What does that mean? Probably the best synonym would be Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. It was an eye-opening realization when I came to the discovery that only once in, in the scriptures does Jesus describe his makeup, how he's put together. And, and if I want to discipline myself for the purpose of becoming like Christ, then that self-revelation is terribly important. It's found at the end of Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, 29, and 30 where Jesus 
holds out his arms and says to those around him, come to me, all you who, who are weary and heavy laden, all you who are weary and broken in the promise, I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am, here it is, I am gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. Isn't that an incredible statement? He doesn't say, I am powerful. I am influential. I am a model of perfection. He says to them, I am gentle and I'm humble. I challenge you in all of your years of learning and growing that you will begin to discipline yourself in the realm of humility. How beautiful would that be? How rare. How wonderful to say, as a result of my years of growing and learning, struggling and hurting, praying, feeling disillusioned and at times dreadfully disappointed, that I graduated from that school a person of humility. And it's hard to find. Some of the most arrogant people I've ever met are in ministry. I say to the shame of my own profession. Some of the most difficult people to deal with, those with a spirit of entitlement, as if they deserve something special, often appear among those with the greater academic degrees. It need not be, and there are some marvelous exceptions. But the tragedy is that there are any in the ranks of the faithful who would see themselves as anything other than the recipients of the grace of God. Gentle, humble in heart. Our journey into the scriptures takes us to the uh, 13th of John, where uh, we're on the last hours of Jesus' life. Many of you are very familiar with it. Because of that, I'm going to use uh, the message as the text and just have you listen from John chapter 13. I want you to see gentleness and humility in action. John 13. Beginning at verse 1, just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave this world to go to the Father. Think of that. He knew the cross was around the corner. He was in the shadow of all of that torture and insulting abuse and finally the treacherous physical pain of Roman spikes in his hands and feet, a spear in his side, thorns on his head. He knew it was coming. It was his last hours. We read he continued to love his dear companions right to the end. It was supper time. The devil by now had Judas, son of Simon, the Iscariot, fully in his, gris, in his grasp, all set for the betrayal. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, and put on an apron. 
I want you to picture it in your mind as we go through these few verses. Without a word, because humility is unannounced, I love it that he doesn't say, and now I'm going to show you what a servant looks like. He doesn't do that. He doesn't exploit the action. Without a word, he gets up from the table. He puts on an apron and poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples. Now, for a moment, let's stretch our imagination and uh, think of ourselves as being one of the twelve. If you enter into the real scene, you'll know that your heart is proud and you know your feet are dirty. We know their hearts are proud because we read in Luke's gospel that that very night of the Last Supper, they were arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. They didn't get it. After three and a half years of personal mentoring at the feet of the Master, at supper time before Gethsemane, they're arguing over which one would come out first in the eyes of the Savior. So their hearts are proud, and by the way, they haven't taken time to wash their feet. Back in those days when you would journey from one place to another, you would walk with sandals, and the, the places you would walk would not be paved, and layers of dust would build up, and if it rained, it would turn into mud, and feet got dirty. So obviously, when you came to the doorway of the place you would enter, there would often be, in a home that was somewhat well-heeled, a servant who would wash your feet as you put off your sandals and came into the home barefoot. If there was no servant, as in this case, it was the common practice for the one who got there first to wash his feet and then to wait for the next one to arrive and to wash his feet, and in turn, the second one would wash the third, and the third would wash the fourth, and in this case, everyone would have his feet washed. None of them had bothered to wash anybody's feet, even their own. So their hearts are proud, their feet are dirty. Jesus notices and knows both. He puts on an apron, he pours the water, and begins to wash their feet. No sermon. No exhortation, just a silent act of humility spontaneously carried out. I love it. So unusual. Jesus says to them as he is moving along, when he gets to Simon Peter, Simon says, Master, you wash my feet. You can see him pulling his feet up toward himself. You're not going to wash my feet. Jesus answered, uh, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but it will be clear enough to you later. Peter persisted. You're not going to wash my feet ever. Which brings up another principle of humility. It takes humility to receive. And some of us are not real good at that. I'm poor at many things. I'm very poor at receiving. Uh, one Christmas, I drove up to our home and I noticed a Volkswagen was parked out front. I knew who owned it. The man had been in our church uh, forever. And uh, I wondered what Bob was doing in our home that Christmas season. I walked in. My wife said to me, Bob Patterson's washing our windows. And I immediately thought, huh, I can take care of my own windows. I, I, I don't need Bob to wash. What? So I walked out in the back porch and I said, Bob, what are you doing? And he said, what? You know, it's kind of a Yogi Berra question. He's, I'm, I'm, I'm washing your, your, your windows. And he, I, I, I said, uh, you know what? I'll tell you what. You wash the outside, I'll wash the inside. He said, no, I, I don't want. I said, okay, you wash downstairs, I'll wash upstairs. He said, Chuck, I want to wash outside, inside, downstairs, and upstairs. And I want you to accept it as my gift to you this Christmas. Suddenly there was a sting in my heart because I realized the pride that's there. Why would anybody in my church need to come wash my windows? They didn't need to. He wanted to. But like Peter, I said, 
Oh, no, you, you're not going to wash mine. Jesus has an interesting response. Uh, Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you cannot be a part of what I'm doing. Peter answered, uh, uh, not only my feet then, wash my hands, wash my head, do it all. Just like Peter, nothing and then too much. Jesus said, if, if you've had a bath in the morning, you only need your feet washed now and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you understand, is holiness, not hygiene. Not a great response. Holiness, not hygiene. So now you're clean. But not every one of you. And then he began the process of washing all 12 disciples' feet, including Judas. I, um, I thought about that. Uh, by the way, humility is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Because of the way Jesus answered Peter, he made it clear, I, I'm not going to fuss with you about this. I'm doing what needs to be done. Many of you need to learn to receive Many of you need to understand that humility is not a doormat to the world for everybody to walk on you. It's not about that. It's one of the most powerful influences you can have on those around you is to humble yourself before the Son of God and to serve those among you within your group, within your class, some in greater need than you. In fact, he gets to the end and he says, do you know what I've done to you? And he describes it as an example. You called me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and your teacher, washed your feet, now what would you imagine? Then you need to wash my feet. But he doesn't say that. He says, if I, your Lord and Master, wash your feet, you need to wash one another's feet. <sighs> Magnificent model of humility carried out among those with whom he had spent three and a half years, and most of them had not even gotten it. Who knows what the needs are in a room this size. It takes a keen mind to spot needs, especially needs not announced. And when you get it, you're sensitive to those needs. A note of encouragement, a word of reassurance, um, a special way of expressing gratitude for someone who did their best but didn't make it. A few who can't keep up, bringing encouragement, a few things more Christ-like. I love the Valley of Vision. It's a series of Puritan prayers. It says it like it is. When you would guide me, I control myself. When you would be sovereign, I rule myself. When you would take care of me, I suffice myself. When I should depend on your providings, I supply myself. When I should submit to your providence, I follow my own will. When I should study and love and honor and trust you, I serve myself. I fault and correct your laws to suit myself. Instead of you, I look to others' approbation, and I am by nature an idolater. Lord, it is my chief desire and designed to bring my heart back to you. Convince me that I cannot be my own God or make myself happy, nor my own Christ to restore my joy, nor my own spirit to teach, guide, and rule me. Take away my roving eye, my curious ear, my greedy appetite, my lustful heart. 
Show me that none of these things can heal a wounded conscience or support a tottering frame or uphold a departing spirit and then take me to your cross and leave me there. It was Amy Carmichael who wrote it this way, from prayer that asked that I may be sheltered from winds that beat on thee, from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher, from silken self, O captain free, thy soldier who would follow thee, from the subtle love of softening things, from easy choices, weakenings, not thus are spirits fortified, not this way went the crucified, from all that dims thy Calvary, Lamb of God, deliver me. Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. I love that line. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel flame of God. Get it while you're at this school. Get the message, whatever it may be. You've come one way, depart another. The investment of your time and effort, and I might add money. is worth your very best in the discipline of humility. Pray with me, will you? Lord, you know every one of us. You know us even better than we'll ever know ourselves. You know us better than our best friend, our mother or our dad. You know us completely. You know our resistance. You know our cynicism. You know our, our, our areas of greatest need, our, our, our weakest link, our tendency to say yes when we need to say no and to say no when we need to be saying yes. Cultivate within us our Father in this context of learning, the learning of the discipline of humility. In the process of these years, get us off the throne of our own lives so that we might serve you as we wash one another's feet. In the name of the Savior, we pray. Everybody said, amen. You're watching WETN-TV, a broadcasting service of Wheaton College. For a copy of this program, please call the Media Resources Department of Wheaton College at 752-5061.